Madam President. Senator from Hawaii. Madam President, this past Friday, our nation lost a giant of a jurist and a champion of gender equality, workers' rights, voting rights, and civil rights. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg understood the critical importance of the Supreme Court in safeguarding our constitutional individual rights. About two years ago, I was sitting next to Justice Ginsburg at a dinner, and we were talking about the concerns we had about a very divided Supreme Court. She shared her concerns that we would see many more five to four decisions coming in the future. Decisions that will roll back civil rights, protections, workers' rights, individual rights, efforts to address climate change, and clearly, a woman's right to choose. Decisions that would harm everyday Americans. As someone who had been on the court for more than a quarter of a century, Justice Ginsburg understood the dangers of partisan split decisions. She spent more than two decades standing up for gender equality, voting rights, workers' rights, and civil rights. She was also often a key vote to uphold critical rights for everyday Americans, such as clean air and clean water protections. Within a few years of joining the Supreme Court, Justice Ginsburg wrote a landmark opinion in a seven to one decision that struck down the Virginia Military Institute's traditional male-only admission policy. She spoke for nearly the entire court when she wrote that differential treatment of men and women I quote, may not be used to create or perpetuate the legal, social, and economic inferiority of women, end quote. More recently, Justice Ginsburg's powerful voice led dissents against partisan five to four decisions. In 2007, she led the dissent in Ledbetter v. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, where the bare five to four majority of the court had determined or undermined the plain language ability to bring gender pay discrimination claims. Justice Ginsburg took the rare step of reading her dissent from the bench saying, quote, in our view, the court does not comprehend or is indifferent to the insidious way in which women can be victims of pay discrimination. I was a member of the US House of Representatives when the Ledbetter decision came down. And I was appalled that a bare majority of the court interpreted the relevant statute in a way it had not been intended. Justice Ginsburg invited Congress to fix the statute to make its intent clearer. And Representative George Miller, the chair of the House Education and Labor Committee at that time, on which I served, led the way to pass the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. And it was the first bill that President Obama signed into law in 2009. In 2013, Justice Ginsburg wrote a scathing dissent in the 5-4 to four decision in Shelby County v. Holder, where a bare majority, once again, of the court gutted the Voting Rights Act. And she wrote then, quote, throwing out pre-clearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet, end quote. Immediately after Shelby County, as should have been expected, many states passed voter suppression laws that made it much more difficult for communities of color to vote. That was the intention of those laws that these states passed. And these voter suppression efforts are ongoing even as we speak and will have a negative impact, a real negative impact on the 2020 election. In 2018, she rebuked the five to four majority in Epic Systems Corporation versus Lewis, which allowed companies to force their workers to arbitrate their claims one by one instead of seeking collective action in court. And why one by one? Because the employer thought, all these employees, they're not gonna fight us one by one by one. So calling the majority decision egregiously wrong, Justice Ginsburg noted that, quote, the inevitable result of today's decision will be the under-enforcement of federal and state statutes designed to advance the well-being of vulnerable workers. And in fact, Epic Systems was one of the cases that I brought up with 
Justice Ginsburg when I sat next to her at dinner, and I said, that was a horrible decision, and she said, and I wrote the dissent. To honor Justice Ginsburg's legacy, we should honor her final wish not to be replaced until a new president is installed. In fact, that's the rule that Senate Republicans made up in 2016. About one hour after Justice Scalia died, on February 13, 2016, Senator McConnell announced an unprecedented new rule. The American people should have a voice in the selection of their next, next Supreme Court justice. Therefore, this vacancy should not be filled until we have a new president. Then, for the next 11 months, Senator McConnell blocked President Obama from replacing Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. That vacancy existed for almost a year. Back then, it didn't take much for other Republicans to join Senator McConnell. In fact, the rumor was that the majority leader had his Republican colleagues all lined up to side with him before he even announced the so-called McConnell rule. That was then. This is now. Now that the tables are turned, and we have a Republican president instead of a Democratic one. Senator McConnell and his Republican colleagues are going back on their word. Within hours of Justice Ginsburg's death, Senator McConnell vowed that, quote, President Trump's nominee will receive a vote on the floor of the United States Senate, end quote. This is what's known as a 180 degree turn or talking out of both sides of your mouth. But of course, he's not the only one. In 2016, Senator Gardner said, I think the next president ought to choose a Supreme Court nominee, and I think that is only fair to the nominee themselves, and I think that is, the only, that is only fair to the integrity of the Supreme Court. But after Justice Ginsburg passing, Senator Gardner flip-flopped, indicating that if President Trump nominates someone he likes, he will vote to confirm. In 2016, Senator Tillis came to the Senate chamber to declare, quote, it is essential to the institution of the Senate and to the very health of our republic not to launch our nation into a partisan, divisive confirmation battle during the very same time the American people are casting their ballots to elect our next president, end quote. But it took Senator Tillis fewer than 24 hours after Judge Justice Ginsburg's death to go back on his word and commit to supporting the, quote, conservative jurist President Trump will nominate. In 2016, Senator Graham repeatedly stated, quote, the election cycle is well underway and the president of the Senate is not to confirm a nominee at this stage of the process, end quote. He even doubled down on his promise claiming, quote, I want you to use my words against me. If there's a Republican president in 2016 and a vacancy occurs in the last year of the first term, you can say, Lindsey Graham said, let's let the next president, whoever it might be, make that nomination, end quote. Then a week after Justice Kavanaugh and Dr. Ford testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Graham said plainly to Jeffrey Goldberg of the Atlantic, quote, if an opening comes, of course he was talking about a Supreme Court opening, if an opening comes in the last year of President Trump's term and the primary process is started, we'll wait for the next election, end quote. When my Democratic colleagues on the Judiciary Committee did what Senator Graham asked, that we hold him to his word, we wrote a letter to him to stick by his word, he refused. He indicated that he would, quote, proceed expeditiously to proceed to process any nomination made by President Trump to fill, end quote. Justice Ginsburg vacancy. There are other Republican senators who stood with Senator McConnell in 2016 and now have changed their tune, including Senators Perdue, Ernst, Barrasso, and Cornyn. And the question the American people should ask is, how can you trust people who don't keep their word? This is an urgent question for the millions of Americans who will lose their health care and reproductive freedoms if President Trump and Majority Leader McConnell are successful in stealing yet another Supreme Court seat. The threat of this nominee the threat this nominee poses to the Affordable Care Act is not some esoteric debate we're having. It is not theoretical. On November 10th, 
the Supreme Court will hear yet another partisan challenge to the ACA. I have no doubt that Donald Trump and the majority leader want a new justice in place to strike down the ACA, depriving millions of Americans of their health insurance, including millions with pre-existing conditions. The more than 6 million Americans who have tested positive for COVID-19 will likely be deemed to have a pre-existing condition. Add them to the Americans who will be devastated if the ACA is struck down by the Trump nominee. Our health care is on the line with the next nominee, regardless of who the nominee is. Note that the Republicans are saying that every single Judiciary Republican is going to vote for the nominee, and we don't even know who the nominee is. So obviously, it doesn't matter who the nominee is. It will be someone who is expected to strike down the ACA. After all, repealing the ACA has long been number one on the president's and Republicans' hit list. But getting rid of the ACA is not the only thing the president is after. The president's nominee will also oppose abortion rights. So that's next on their hit list. Let me be clear, the future of Roe v. Wade is on the line. The future of a woman being able to control her own body is on the line. With so much at stake with this nomination, the millions of Americans who revere Justice Ginsburg are not just going to sit by and do nothing while my Republican colleagues try to steal yet another Supreme Court seat. In fact, they're showing up in droves in front of the Supreme Court to show their support for all that Justice Ginsburg stood for. They are going to fight back. And uh, you can be assured I will be right there fighting back with them. They aren't going to fall for the trumped up justifications, explanations, and pretexts that Senate Republicans are using to go back on their word. And I am confident that in six weeks' time, the American people will hold them accountable. Madam President, I yield the floor.